thumbs up. Right. Okay. Hello and good morning to everybody um, and welcome to our final session in the trustee training series. I'm David, I'm partner at Buzzacott and I'm going to take you through this session. Um, I'm assuming you can all hear me, we've done a test. Um, this is a Teams event, um, usually I like to pace the room and run these as a workshop, but um, feel free, free to use the chat box. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into Buzzacott because I think for some of you it's the fourth of uh, four sessions. So hopefully you've heard enough about Buzzacott. So I'll skip straight into um, what we're going to talk about. Um, just a bit of introduction from me. Um, I'm David. I run um, Buzzacott's tech, data privacy and philanthropy practice, um, as well as having an involvement in Buzz's internal tech, property strategy and all that sort of stuff. Um, bit of personal history. I started life as um, a very young police officer um, decided I wanted a little bit more fun um, so morphed into becoming an accountant um, um, and I now specialize in advising clients to get the best out of their tech investment uh, and I'm a bit of an evangelist in, in using tech for improvement uh, and I've recently done a, a, a diploma for digital business leaders and transformation. So we have some time together this morning to recap where we are on cyber risk with a focus really on not-for-profits and leadership of not-for-profits, trustees in the cyber world. Some of what we may discuss may initially be a little disconcerting. It's not the positive, most positive of subject to discuss and unfortunately it's a scary old world at the moment. Um, but we hopefully, we're, once we've, we've kind of done the negative bit, we'll move on to some strategy and tips. Um, and bizarrely, we're one day early for Cybersecurity Month, which starts tomorrow. Um, specifically within this hour, we're going to cover the agenda you can see, um, but start us off with a quick bit of virtual housing. As webinar attendees, your webcams and microphones are off, but you can speak to us at any time using the chat box uh, on your screens. We'll address as many questions as we have time for at the end of the session um, and any that we don't get to we'll try and answer in a, a written uh, written follow up. Um, the questions will be answered anonymously. Uh, the session is being recorded only me and the slides so no, no worries there um, uh, along with the slide deck and the recording will be sent to you afterwards. Um, our time today, we can't really pos possibly in 40, 45, 50 minutes cover cyber strategy. Um, but the one reflection I would have specifically for the not-for-profit not, not sector, over the last couple of days, there's been a, a report that's come out uh, in Cyber Digital uh, that might be particularly interesting to trustees and in the sector that we all kind of participate in. And that's that women, um, fame and economically disadvantages are high profile targets and tend to suffer more from the impact of cybercrime, uh, particularly the exploitation recently of the Black Lives Matter movement by text phishing and that sort of stuff. Um, for the economically disadvantages, it seems to be those, uh, there seems to be a, a, an emergence of get rich, apparent get rich screen, quick get rich scheme, excuse me. And specifically for women, a lot of social media hacking, phishing, cyber stalking, and unfortunately revenge porn attacks um, to try and blackmail uh, women. So on that kind of slightly negative note, um, let's kick off by looking at uh, the first slide um, and we're going to have a look at the landscape. I'm going to dive into these in a little more detail later, but the aim today is to, to arm you with the knowledge of where the main threats are coming from. Get an understanding of the attack vectors, um, some tools and some strategies to protect your organization and your people. We are going to focus naturally on specific remote working words, thoughts as we hopefully start to repopulate but continue to work in a hybrid model. Um, some of the challenges that we face as trustees um, and leaders of charities with privacy and data protection. Um, and bizarrely, all we're talking about today, everything we talk about today is equally transferable, not only to your kind of day job, I suppose, or part time job, but also in your personal world. So I, I hope it kind of arms people. As I say, I'm an evangelist to, to keep things safe. There are some time at the end to deal with the specific challenges. Um, if we could move on to the next slide. Um, let's talk about the new normal. Um, you know, 15, 16 months ago, there were 
what Microsoft has said were two years of digital transformation in two weeks, um, you know, in the two weeks before lockdown. There was an immediate test of all of our business continuity plans. Um, and bizarrely, if someone who's been involved from risk for quite a while, pandemics usually feature very low on risk registers. It's, you know, it's like earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. They tend to be fairly low down there. Um, and of course, we're facing the potential of people being incapacitated, unable to kind of support the, the day job. There was a rapid lockdown. There was logistical challenges with kit, people, people moving to home working, not only the physical, but the physiological, mental challenges, mental health challenges, you know, the, the emotional challenges that we've all had to face with. Um, you know, and with that, as leaders of organisation, that brings collaboration challenge. You know, if we use the word supervision as, as a generic term, but you know, how do we encourage and do the best we can for our people at home? How do we make sure that stuff's getting done? People are working in new circumstances and in new ways. Um, and unfortunately with this, with all of these pressures, there's a potential for error and uncertainty. Uh, and unfortunately that kind of brings in the, the risk of uh, phishing and cyber attacks and things like that. And I think it's fair to say that people, what I've kind of, reflected on this, people seem to have a more relaxed mindset when they're working at home and working on their own kit um, rather than maybe a business approach. And then we saw quite a specific increase in COVID themed attacks. You've probably seen some of these, you know, click here if you want to test, click here if you want to know what's happening. Um, and unfortunately, these are all payloads. Um, our work boundaries for privacy, for protection, have extended into the home where probably historically for many of us that wasn't the way. Um, and BYOD normally stands for bring your own device, but for us in the tech world, it often means bring your own disaster. Um, and you know, that blending of the work and home machinery. Um, the ideal world for a tech team is for nobody to switch a machine on uh, or pot potentially attack, attach an alien device to the office charity network. You see, on our office machines, we protect productivity, protection, but where we're accessing work stuff on home machines, we're not secure. 62% of machines, we're told, um, um, and malware attacks are on home machines. So, you know, you might have the kids um, accessing games and traditionally less secure payloads on your machine that you're also doing some work on. Um, there's the other kind of psychological asset. If you're accessing work stuff on home machines, as you're in front of your own machine, there may be that temptation to blend the work and the private world. And where in the office, it might be a little bit more visible. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely sure we trust all of our people, but as we said later, 60% of cyber challenges um, are actually caused by our own people, whether that, you know, minimum amount of those are malicious, the majority of those tend to be accidental. You know, we've got home connectivity, um, people connecting to home broadband machines, home routers to me is a primary concern. I'm not going to ask the question and ask people to put their hands up, but I wonder how many people have changed the default password that came with their home routers. Um, because frankly, if you lift up the router, it tends to be printed up uh, underneath it. So we need to learn how to do that. We've got the Internet of Things, you know, the emergence, um, we'll see later, had the emergence of um, Alexa, um, Siri, that sort of stuff, multiple devices on our networks, ring, um, ring, um, got doorbells um, and things like that. These things are all connected to our home networks, all have the ability to be compromised, baby monitors, cameras, everything. Um, you know, we got some, we had a really resurgence of new applications, especially the communication ones, you know, Zoom, Zoom, you know, in, in our view, started off as fairly insecure, they caught up, um, but we saw kind of historic Zoom bombing and, and ransom and that sort of stuff. You know, and my view is personal devices that you have at home need to have the same level of hygiene and protection as quasi corporate ones. They're twice as likely to be infected than corporate ones. Um, and of course, we've had the growth of shadow OT, probably necessar necessarily because, you know, we're all trying to keep the lights on, keep the day job going. Um, and how do you get it done? How do you get the work done? OK, so let's move on to the next slide. Um, I think it'll reflect on the kind of financial pressure. I think we're telling a little bit of a caller. Um, the only thing is with kind of the pandemic and a quasar recession, it 
brings increased criminal activity. There tends to be more financial crime, you know, and unfortunately we're seeing an, in an industrialization of ransomware. Ransomware as a service and, and, you know, what that means is, you know, it's becoming very cheap and very easy to buy a kit um, to do ransomware yourself and other people. Um, and unfortunately, as, as our backup and recovery processes have seen to improve, we've, she, we've seen a double down on the ransomware attack. It's not just about holding to your ransom, encrypting your data. It's now about extorting and blackmailing you, right, we've got your data. If you don't pay up, we're going to publish. Um, and it really depends on how you're strong and how risky the information is in an organization. And especially a lot of us who are in the not-for-profit sector, um, the PR risk of that um, could be quite substantial. Um, and as I said before, the pandemic seen a massive rise in uncertainty exploited by criminals. You know, and it's fair to say we've all had budgets reduced because of pandemic. We may have saved some occupation costs, but you know, we, we're having to focus on keeping the lights on, keeping our people supported, managing reduced investment income potential, reduced donations, especially those that perhaps have, you know, during the lockdown had shops um, uh, and that sort of thing. Donation has has definitely reduced. You know, we've got reduced resources. People are incapacitated, um, expertise. They may not even be in the organisation. Moving on to the next slide on, on confidence. Um, I'm galloping through the first bit so that we can think about, take some more time on the second bit. Um, I think it's fair to say confidence in not for profit sector has is recovering from some of the scandals and the data and the operations in probably 2015, 2016, and we're some years on to that. And I think naturally we'll see an uptick in public confidence for the not for profit sector because of the pandemic. We'll see that, you know, people have turned, uh, not for profit sector has, um, as someone who's involved in philanthropy and supporting grant makers, they've stepped in to provide immediate funding to deal with government lag. Um, however, that has meant that there's a potential for fraud and cybercrime. You know, politically, we're going to talk later about, you know, I, I don't, I'm, I'm an apolitical person, uh, I don't like to talk about politics, but it does have an impact on uh, cybersecurity and crime. We'll talk, talk a little bit later about some of the attack vectors uh, and state sponsored activity. We've kind of gone through Brexit and the US elections, which historically um, were a massive uptick in cybercrime and Twitter um, kind of modification of uh, results. Uh, I think the only thing on politics really to make a note of, and it may only kind of impact those of us who have international kind of operations. The UK has only got data adequacy for four years. When we were part of the EU, we had the same data adequacy as the rest of Europe, but um, it's something new. Uh, the EU has only given the UK adequacy for four years, um, and that's dependent on whether we revise UK data laws. And I think there's some plans within the UK government to really reform UK data laws. I'm hopeful and positive that they're going to be for the better and as historically we've been a forefront at the forefront of protecting people's personal data. I think there will be a focus on continuity and keeping the things going. Um, uh, and just to flag, it's not law yet, but there's going to be a new information commissioner. You know, Elizabeth Denham is the current information commissioner. She's standing down. It's dependent on government process. Um, the new guy coming in is ex New Zealand privacy commissioner. And it's bizarre. We, we, Elizabeth Denham was a Canadian privacy commissioner, and we're now going to have the New Zealand privacy commissioner. Uh, he's an ex lawyer who's been practicing in privacy for some years. Um, we're not, you know, we're we're out of the U.S. election. 20, say, 2016 saw an incredible uptick, um, and it's fair to say our politicians are notably, you know, naturally focusing all of their resources, perhaps on pandemic, um, post-Brexit world, and getting as many HGV drivers uh, as they can at the moment. Um, politically, state-sponsored, we'll come on to, but. Chinese targeting of the telecom sector has been massive over the last year. You know, North Korea are mining cryptocurrencies, financial services businesses historically, and it's some time ago now, have had a had a hand in the wanna cry disruption within the health service and uh, um, political kind of 
environment. You know, industrial espionage is, is going through the roof. Vietnam are targeting automotive, China are targeting healthcare. Um, the mayor of in 2019, the mayor of New Orleans declared a major incident due to sustained attacks, and we've seen recent infrastructure attacks on water and power. Um, you can only under you can only really believe that that's state sponsored, disruption sponsored. Um, it could be organized crime. We don't know yet. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, rushing to that <laughs> demand and regulation. You know, we've spoken about home working, but it's fair to say there was a pre pandemic shift to any time, any place working and the, the, the challenges that thing uh, that that brought with us. You know, I always like to look at the what happens in an Internet Minute slide. Um, I've been tracking this for about five or six years. Um, it's amazing how you know, a lot of our resources historically were in the in the kind of corporate or organizational world were protecting emails and networks and things like that. It's amazing that the, 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 the natural shift away from email and text messaging to the multitude of other communication tools. Um, this is a 2021 um, and the challenges. I mean, frankly, who'd heard of TikTok um, two years ago? By the way, it's a Chinese tool um, and, you know, the, there are significant challenges on that. Um, we've spoken about GDPR in 2018. Um, there isn't going to be an increased requirement to protect the rights of the information we hold. It, it seems to be the forgotten kind of relative within the GDPR law, but you know, GDPR says that if you're holding assets, you need to protect them adequately. Um, uh, the two main criticisms that we see coming from prosecutions um, from the Information Commissioner are lack of technology protection and lack of training, um, speaking to the, the people side of things. You know, we've seen regulation hardening. The education sector over the last 12 to 15 months has seen a massive attacks, um, especially ransomware um, exploitation. Um, and I think the education sector, my education co sector colleagues will tell me that um, where it's in the uh, guidance for, for running academy and school, it was recommended. It's now, I think, a must. Um, I think that's still in draft, and we're, we're still analysing that. Significant refocus of, um, you know, historically it was about safeguarding, um, handling people's sensitive data. There's now, I think, a much larger focus on the education sector. Uh, and on cyber protection. OK, let's move on to the uh, attack vectors. A um, little bit scary, some of this. Moving on to the next slide. Um, if you click on the first one, please. So organised crime. Um, those of you of a certain age like me will recognise who this is. Cyber crime is very lucrative, very organised and very cheap. Criminals can throw multiple attacks out using networks of compromised um, um, compromised uh, computers. Um, I spoke earlier about the industrialized on the dark web. You can buy a kit, all the codes do ransomware or service, and we've seen massive increase in organizations that are providing ransomware as a service to any kind of organized crime state sponsor who and they're taking revenue share. So Revile, Lockbit, all those organizations. We thought Revile had gone away, but they, there seems to be their, their website seems to have gone live again, um, which means that's the that's their method of publishing compromised data that they've stolen from organizations to hold you to ransom. Um, you know, a batch of compromised email addresses, you can buy a, a, as much as a, a thousand email addresses for less than 50 cents on the dark web. Um, what we're also seeing is payloads in PDF office file attachments. You know, as we're getting better at protecting the parameters, we've moved, a lot of us have moved to Microsoft 365, and I have to say they're award leading kind of protection capability. The criminals are finding other ways of getting stuff in, and, and it's unfortunate that they only have to win once. We have to win every time. Um, and we spoke about the industrialization. It's now, you know, it's a safer, more anonymized way of, of raising funds than perhaps selling drugs on a street corner or importing drugs. So that's where we are. You know, in terms of state sponsor, you know, it's fair to say the Chinese army has a whole division focused on cyber warfare. Um, not focused on our own forces, focusing on guerrilla warfare. Um, you know, as I said before, North Korea was widely accepted as the architect of the WannaCry attack that took down hospitals, local authorities, and frankly, you know, we had people die as a result of that. Um, 
Russia has held widely that they were part of the Twitter attack during the 2016 presidential elections in democratic stronghold, trying to skew and its history now, but it just anecdotally talks to the rainy day on the day of the election that Trump was gaining ground, uh, sorry, that Clinton was gaining ground um, and the Democrats had um, kind of got relaxed about whether they went out to vote and it was a rainy day so traditionally rainy days are not great for for voting turnouts um there was a twitter storm um galvanizing uh the republican voters to go out and vote for trump and we we saw you know a bit of a surprise kind of like brexit and cambridge analytica um you know moving on to next well you, you know the we've got the spotty teenage oh, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a trope um long thought of the romantic ideal of the kid hacking for sport but with ransomware as a service thought that this had disappeared but it's time to come back and we saw talk talk was happened from somebody in a dublin attic um you know and they got a massive fine um as a result of that moving on um so you know, hacktivists, I mean, it was really encouraging in some ways to see that um, the hacktivists were focusing their, their, their wares on Dionysus and they'd stopped, especially during pandemic, you know, we hear anecdotal stories of if you could demonstrate that you were having been hit by a ransomware attack, if you could demonstrate that you were helping um, the not-for-profit sector and you can provide evidence, uh, it was a ransom technique, um, to reduce either reduce or actually get away from the ransom altogether because frankly the ransomers were all so busy and they would succeeded so many times that anybody connected with the charity they were leaving alone um that's not not a way to get complacent i just say that as um uh, of where we are what can we predict for 2022 you know i don't have a crystal ball but you know it's fair to say during the last 15 months we've all moved to some kind of cloud working and of course our digital strategies have all been mobile first work anywhere do anything um, so fishing for what we call SaaS credential software as a service credential cloud-based um, cloud-based software so our accounting software our, our Microsoft 365 software and this sort of stuff all held online um, that's going to we feel massively increased and i think that's generally held that you know the days of reusing the same password over and over again because once you've broken one you've then got the keys to the kingdom you know and it's fair to say that the first but facebook quizzes that we all see oh what was your first ever pop song what was the first car you drove what was your pet's first pet's name they're not facebook quizzes they're actually harvesting data so people can fish you um so one thing I would say, please don't do any of those Facebook quizzes um, if you go to Facebook at all. We're going to see more encryption, but as I said before, industrialization, you see more extortion. Um, so that talks to segregation and network, which we're talking about yet, you know, not keeping all of your eggs in one basket. And I think, you know, what we've seen in state sponsor is the covert cryptocurrency mining, you know, hijacking of your assets to, to be able to out and go out and harvest um, crypto mining. It's quite lucrative. It's anonymous. Um, so, you know, that speaks to having good endpoint security. So you're making sure that your machines at the end of the line are all sorted. Moving on to the next slide, please. It's conscious of the time. So we're seeing these are the top five causes of breach. You know, we're spending about, and if we focus on these, these are kind of end user specific. A lot of these, you know, the click too quick. Oh, that's a link. Um, I haven't had time to think about it. I'm too busy. I'll just click on that. Bang, PDF has already loaded some uh, stuff to not only your local machine ex exfiltrated that, but being able to quietly um leave a back door open into your network that can be exploited and what we call lateral movement um uh, so end user click to click um weak default passwords you know changing the root of passwords people reusing um the same password on, in multiple sites uh you know there's we'll talk about passwords in a bit there's a lot of contentions you know insecure configuration you know that's all about patch patch and more patching uh, it's all about um making sure kit is up to date um you know it's unfortunately it costs money but frankly they're exploited all over the place um and you know 
so we talk about unpatched insecure configuration we sort of about network segregation that means not putting your golden assets all in one place and also making sure that not everybody can see them or people can't move into them there's a, a they're ring fenced away from any problems so moving on to the next slide um, some other things to be away with we are in a very hyper collected world at the moment you know we we all love apps and this blending of the expectation that our people have in the in their personal world to have that translated into their uh, organizational world you know the internet of things um sad to say we've seen hacks and grooming through baby monitors um webcams and doorbells spoke out you know frankly we educate and entertain our children online in communities that's where we are at the moment so you know, if you believe the conspiracy theorists, we're all being listened to, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Um, but the fact is, we need to understand all of the apps, the connections, the incentive benefits that many are free. Conversation the other day, I happen to know the guy who was behind Dunhumley back in the early days. Um, and all of this Tesco club card is not about getting free tickets to Thorpe Park, it's actually driving the logistics data. I mean, that's been widely hoped. But you know where that can be used potentially for political sway we all saw what happened with um cambridge analytica um you know the the use of facebook to target messaging against certain communities in the political spectrum um i only ask one thing i'm not conspiracy theorist but how often have you had a facebook advert pop up for something that you may have spoken about or searched somewhere else on i just say you know i know our marketeers are online but um i won't talk about data analysis and things like that um so moving on to the, the next thing so let's get on to the strategy I, you know hopefully i haven't kind of scared you too much but um let's get on to what we can do as leaders to, to help ourselves um you know i think there are there are top five these are the top five questions as trustees as leader organizations we should be asking not only of our own people but the people that we've outsourced the support to our for um you know i don't want to be disrespectful because there are some really good external tech support and why wouldn't you outsource things because these people do it all day long every day long you know every day they're experts at it i've seen some really good ones there is the challenge though there's those organizations that give you lots of love as um, just before you go live and sign the contract it might give you a little bit of love in the first two months after you sign the contract but then i wonder how often you hear from them um how often you check in on them um you know and i think we as leaders trustees ceos that sort of stuff have to know what's going on so the first question where is our data have we got an inventory of our data and that's not just about gdpr that's about do we know which systems our golden assets are served in or are, are stored in we can't protect it if we actually don't know where it is um, and now there is a wider boundary than the historic on-premise um, environment that we used to go you know use of cloud services you know even things like and i just flagged this um, as a matter of interest but we all use event management software um, ticketing event management software because it's efficient it does what it says it does and it's not a problem but often a lot of the data for those where we're getting people to sign up for for events is hosted in the us um, so that's not a problem per se we just need to know that and we need to know from the supplier of that what they're doing to keep our information safe you know the second question it's a collective problem you know cybersecurity is not a tech problem historically i'm an old old guy but um, i won't say what i was going to say but historic businesses ran on oil so manufacturing ran on oil it ran on manual labor a modern organization needs to run on data um and you know we historically we've put a lot of time into health and safety safeguarding you know recruitment and things like that i'm not convinced from what i've observed that we're putting quite the same emphasis um, at board level um, and at trustee level on cyber transformation or cyber security. Is it discussed? In my view, it should be right up there on the top of the risk register. It ought to be a specialist trustee or someone like with a passion for cyber and digital. Um, and are there awareness of the risk of what would happen if um, 
you know, whether it's the challenges of operational, whether it's the financial impact of, a, of an attack, or frankly now the reputational impact of an attack. Um, you know, if I think of some of the, the, the not-for-profit clients, there's a lot of sensitive personal data, people's abilities, sexual preferences, all of that sort of stuff that, that people work with. Have we all collectively rehearsed as a technology board or as a trustee board? Not what we do if it happens, but what we do when it happens. What's our technology recovery? What is our PR plan? Um, who's going to negotiate a ransom if we feel, you know, it's up to us whether we pay one or not. And, you know, I don't know where you stand on that, but there needs to be somebody who is a ransom negotiator that who's experienced in this that needs to get in front of uh, the ransomware operators and have a conversation. So that leads on to who do we go to for some help? You know, have we got, because remember in mind, if you're storing it on the computer, chances are you may not be able to get to it. Um, so it needs to be somewhere where you know you can get to it um, and it's open um, or stored somewhere else on a trust aid board. Often in congruency with keeping stuff inside the corporate network and maybe keeping stuff outside, but there are ways that you can protect that. The next thing, are we doing, are we, in mean, and what I mean by we is the technology team and our support thing doing the basic rights and we'll come on doing the basics right and that comes back to patching backups all that sort of stuff. come on to that a little bit you know I said before are we being proactive have we actually had the conversation have we tasked someone have we empowered somebody to work out not if something happens but when it happens and frankly are we investing enough? It really does need to be a separate line on the budget, um, I would say, in my view. Um, I can't, I'd love to give you a benchmark, but it really depends on how you operate, how risk averse, how risk you're not, what kind of behavior, you know, how you're all structured. Um, the only thing I would say, it probably needs to be increased. So that's what the questions of leadership needs to ask. Let's talk about the strategies that we can moving on to the next slide um, on um, it's a little bit old hat now, but it really does send a question. I, I call it the cyber trinity um, and the mindset needs to be not if it happens, but when it does. Um, you know, the, the one moving on to the next slide, the one thing that's at the top of that is people. Um, Cyber protection, I think there is a historic mindset that it's the problem of the tech team um, and technology is the answer. Whilst it's right that the CIO or the CTO, Chief Information Officer, Chief Technology Officer, need to have a seat at the boardroom table, uh, it's not just their problem. Um, I've been into, you know, I've recently, it's anecdotally, I've kind of recently tried to help an academy that were unfortunately hit by an attack um, and I think it was a massive wake up call because they thought well Dave in Dave in the IT team said we were okay well my question was well, what did you do you ask Dave to prove how he knew you were okay and you know you've outsourced it to whoever provides your software how do you know that they're doing their job properly um, <laughs> there's very little that happens in our organizations that is non-technical non-technology um, it really does need to be up there um, privacy and protection um, pretty much up there uh, in terms of focus and at least spoken about every meeting. There is an expectation I spoke earlier about um, the ICO um, uh, having a you know the prosecutions it's not just about information privacy and I think what I'm seeing in a lot of not-for-profit organizations is that data privacy so GDPR is handled quite well. Um, unfortunately, there are organisations that thought, well, GDPR was a project. We ticked it off in 2018. Um, we've done that. Um, it's not that at all. You need to be constantly raking through that and reviewing. Um, there is an expectation that you should train new people regularly um, using different messaging payloads. So whether it's test drops when we had them, um, but videos, there's a multitude of free stuff, especially for the not-for-profit center. I would point you to, you probably already know this, but if you don't, I would point you, point you to the National Cybersecurity Center, NCSC. Um, they've got a lot of multitude of uh, information, videos, YouTube clips, um, poster campaigns, PDF campaigns, email campaigns, specifically focused about 
not for profit who maybe not quite have the budget that other organizations having um you know fishing is huge business and it's one of the main attack business so fishing depends on people to either do something wrong to have a lack of awareness um to you know to put basics in i think a lot of organizations are now dealing with what we call spear phishing so sending something to someone in the finance department who then says i you know it's the ceo here i'm stuck at a conference i need some money and then i don't think we're at that place now where lots of not for profit organizations don't have an awareness of that and also don't have processes to make sure that sort of stuff doesn't happen so callbacks you know fraud checks this sort of stuff but if you don't it's something to be your people need to be aware of you know i i got an email a couple of days ago we changed um, our supplier for adobe, adobe pdfs and we had a credit on what on our last one and to me and the first my first thought when i saw it was because the first question was can you send me through a blank check or your bank details so we can send you a refund and I th my first thought but it would be wouldn't it would be this looks a very sophisticated fish so get on the phone speak to your account manager is this happening yes it is so you know that's we <laughs> my background is um in my first career um there was an, an adage of abc which was um accept nothing believe no one challenge everything uh, and unfortunately that's I think, where we need to be at the moment it's uh, a scary old place at the moment the other thing facebook i spoke earlier about the impact on um recent impact on not underprivileged um female and the BAME community in terms of cyber attacks. You know, Facebook um, and Microsoft are the most impersonated organizations. And I think, you know, as, as a lot of our people have worked at home over the past 15 months, there's that blending, oh, I'll just have a look at Facebook, what's going on? Well, unfortunately, it's not really that secure. So Facebook is the first in most important personated organization, then followed by Microsoft. Someone fills up a mic what looks like a Microsoft. Oh, we need your password and that sort of stuff. Um, it's then followed by Apple, Google, PayPal and Dropbox. They're the most impersonated organizations in terms of phishing. OK. Um, so that's the people. What do we do about it? Um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, technology, what can we do? So this is the bit that your internal and external tech team can do as a minimum to help yourself. So, you know, a lot of us have moved to Office 365, Microsoft 365 software as a service. Um, there needs to be a real focus on on how it's configured and set up. You know, things like there are some really good out of the box stuff that you can do that really filters down the attack vectors massively so things like risky locations if you've got nobody in azerbaijan then don't allow anybody to log in from azerbaijan that's a simple setting um, in microsoft 365 you know if you don't have an operational interaction with you know remote access from china just don't allow it they just won't get in there um this uh, microsoft th um, security center and you'll be amazed by the amount of attacks that don't get through that come in from those um, locations, you know, like 20 or 30 per person per night, um, that kind of stuff. There's a stuff like, you know, Microsoft 365 has geolocation capabilities. You need your suppliers to look at that, to advise you. Um, there's a thing called impossible travel, um, which I think is delightful. I mean, if I log in here and buy some pause now, um, if I log in here, suddenly three minutes later, there's a login attempt from Greece. It knows that I can't get from here to Greece in half a second. So it just ignores it. And as long as I've logged in properly, it won't allow the other one to think to, to come in. There's a lot of data leak prevention um, capabilities, you know, before we get too deep into things like being able to internally mark stuff so it doesn't go outside. Microsoft massively grown up in terms of Defender uh, um, yeah, and, and that remote working capability yeah I, I you know i'm not a microsoft sponsor and i'm not even a microsoft partner but i i, I the beauty of it is they've got the budget to invest every single month there's an update you probably won't see most of it but be talking to your tech guys be talking to your um, suppliers to do it firewalls firewalls are really important um when budgets are the one thing that kind of gets forgotten and the default password changes um 
Also, make sure the local firewall is enabled on your laptops, on your um, organizational devices. All ports are closed by default, so a port is, you know, we need certain ports open for things like Zoom calls, Teams calls, that sort of stuff. But, you know, our view is it's zero trust. All ports should be closed by default, and there needs to be a business case that you know about for every open port and service. Anti-malware, you know, traditional on-premise malware really doesn't, in my view, doesn't react quick enough. We're seeing zero day threats, which is a threat that starts and ends in a day. So by the time your um, malware, your antivirus software has gone out to update, um, it's already been closed down, it's too late uh, and they've got in. So there's been a real shift to behavioral base. So historically, malware was, um, malware software was signature based. So it looked for certain uh, identifiers within files and within code. Um, now it's shifting towards the more, I don't, I don't talk about AI and machine learning, but that's what it's, it's moving towards. So if um, your software, antivirus software senses a change in behavior or a change of activity or people going to places that they haven't normally come in from or coming in from places, then it'll quarantine the machine by default until you unlock it. And that's the kind of behavior we've got to have in place um, to make sure. Um, Anti-spoofing, that's a good one to have. You know, we're seeing a lot of what any e emails that come through that look like someone's spoofed our internal email address but actually when you dive behind it it's not an internal so you know why would i be sending an email with a funny address on the back to a colleague i might be chatting on teams or something like that so i think you know you might want to quarantine by default but you might want to keep an eye on that and certainly warn when it happens and i think the big saver and and, and this is a real challenge and it's a challenge with the education sector where you know children can't keep phones in classrooms and teachers can't have phones in classrooms but you know multi-factor authentication has got to be you know we've been doing it for a number of years on banks we do it by card reads and stuff like that in in our view it, it ought to be the default for any new a couple of things multi-factor authentication a single sign-on um, so you know multi-factor authentication is that um, you either have to put in a code or a facial recognition something over and above just username and password for something independent of what you're doing um, than the, the system in front of you so um, you know that's what we talk about moving on to the next slide um, so that's what the tech team do and some, some, some tips there. So the next thing is we've spoken about policies, processes and procedures, you know, practicing what happens um, when you get attacked. But the other processes and policies and, you know, people need to understand what's expected of them. You know, if you've got someone working for you, they need to know what their boundaries are, what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. Have they... Oh, firstly, are they aware of what you allow, what you don't allow? Are they aware of how to keep things safe? Have they signed off against that? You know, that really speaks to the induction process. And then at the other end of the relationship, you know, charities, especially fundraising charities, naturally there's quite a lot of churn. Um, people coming and going, there's organisations. So the key one in this is, is not your starter process. Starter process is good to get people on the right footing, but it's actually the lever process. And by the way, there's some funding um, benefit of doing that because as soon as you shut them down on Office 365, you don't get charged for that, that account. Um, you know, it's a pay-as-you-go kind of uh, service. So, you know, Lever processes, as soon as somebody's leaving, they need to be locked out. That's the benefit of things like single sign on, real active directory control that, you know, HR team are talking to the tech team or talking to the leadership team. You know, there's a process that as soon as someone says they're leaving, what happens? You know, I know it's efficient, but temporary staff is is always a challenge because none of in the tech community, we don't like unnamed account like receptionist at or temp at or worker one at um, in terms of their account because you can't audit who did what and when and then if something happens you can't forensically examine who it was who actually did it where it came in because you've got this generic kind of login account you know we, we've got to stop doing that frankly um, and the other thing on people, you know, it, it came out this morning. I've got a credit charity digital for this, and it was an advertorial. So, uh, but the message is clearly there um, that their opinion is that the board, digital leadership, is kind of holding back digital transformation. 62% of organizations 
plus do not talk about digital transformation don't understand it you know we're all on a lifelong learning process but you know frankly it's a world that i wasn't brought up with i've managed to enjoy understand it and kind of scare myself rigid sometimes because it's partly my job but you know we've got to get that kind of implementation on there um you know training of people we've spoken about awareness campaigns and resources on um and i think that's um pretty much it um, processes you know we ought to be benchmarking ourselves as a minimum against cyber essential cyber aware something along those lines um to make sure that we're at least getting the basics right you know in 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 my view cyber essentials accreditation whether it's your own self accreditation or you get it um uh, audited by an external party is the first step that's the basic level of of protection and it's quite hard to get at the moment um especially with the gdpr kind of concepts um you know i'm not sure many of us have got the budget and the expertise to go for things like iso 27001 um but that's the ideal standard i think or you know and and, and more and more is coming out um so moving on, I won't dwell too long on that, but I think it's good to ask the question of your board and your committee. Um, you know, remote homeworking, uh, we've spoken a lot about this actually. I, I've kind of fed it in elsewhere. So, you know, that you'll see this on the slide, but you know, these risky behaviors, the blending of the home work life um, by necessity, um, and how do we protect our boundaries? Uh, moving on to the next one. Um, when we return, um, some of you may have returned already. We're seeing a number of our clients, some of our clients, some of my clients um, in the um, trust and foundation sectors actually given up their office premises and they've gone for full home, full remote or pretty much full hybrid in that if they need to get together, they'll go and hire someone because that's cheaper than um, spending central London footprint. Um, you know, when we do go back, I think it's time to firstly congratulate ourselves that we've managed to keep going through the pandemic we keep keeping our people safe and uh, and then you know but it is that really once in an almost business lifetime opportunity to almost start with a new blank sheet of paper because that's where a lot of organizations are you know it's a, an approach i take with most projects at buzzacott is it's always a chance to actually i don't care what happened before now is a new day a lot of us especially property strategy you tend to be tied into longer term leases um, if you're not they're not very good premises um, so this really is a, uh, an opportunity to look at the future strategy of the organization you know a review of our policies you know is our induction policy right is our information security policy appropriate for both the home and remote working capability what's our physical security look like you know we've we've coped with the uh, 15 months of home working we're starting to repopulate we're starting to regenerate um how's our physical security looking you know that old, i know tech guys get very nervous because you've got these you know they don't want external inverted commas alien devices on their network but unfortunately it's a fact of life now um you know i think physical security updates you know i was reflecting something here the other day that by necessity because of airflow and things like that we probably unlocked a few doors um do they still need to be unlocked you know that's the physical security side of things um you know we allow people to bring your own device what's our future policy do people understand what we expect them and what we allow them to do to get access to our our network what do they have what protocols do they have to do do and that sort of stuff um you know organizational change registers you know i think we there was one massive test of our business continuity plan and that's when you know the two weeks before we thought a lockdown was coming um that happened but i think it's time you know what does it look like now is the old business continuity plans that everyone put up on the shelf and gather dust are they still appropriate now and can you get to them if something happens you know pandemic's got to rise up there you know what do we do if key personnel are struck down and sadly you know we all know where the end result of that can be um and you know training it's a time you know it's a great opportunity to reinvigorate people with training you know with, with the benefit of the last year okay moving on uh, to the next slide um a quick word on digital leadership it's only because i'm quite passionate about digital leadership um 
you know, we said earlier, there are chain, you know, opportunity, digital leadership needs to have a seat at the board. You know, I'll come on to what makes a digital lead, what I think makes a digital, makes a digital and what's commonly held and makes us a digital leader. Um, but, but actually, what should we be talking about? You know, we've, for those of you who are fundraisers, um, fundraising capability has gone through the roof. Um, you know, click to donate, pandemic, people seem to be more philanthropic minded, um, which is great because we're all hopefully trying to take care of them. But there are changing stakeholders needs, you know, the digital imperative, you know, we talk about the lenses. So stay, we, we also need to stakeholders and stakeholders are not just our people, as you, as you know, they're, they're our donors, they're our um, clients, they're people who use our services, they all need to get, receive, interact with our services in different ways. Um, you know, there's a lot more digital channels to market and, and I think not for profit sector because of the drive on fundraising has been brilliant at this, you know, the not exploitation, but the, the use of all the different channels to to get the message out there, to get support. Um, and I think data, you know, data is a missed opportunity. Um, and this is kind of an anecdote. I, I have a trust and foundation client um, who is a, a UK giver and we've been helping them with dashboards. You know, they're very folk. Fortunately, they're in a position that they don't really have to worry. They're an endowed foundation kind of. Um, they don't have to worry about where the money comes in. So a lot of their focus is on outreach impact. Um, you know, so we lit up their dashboards of, you know, they're a UK national giver lit up their dashboards um, and the first thing that everybody does is they challenge data well your dashboard must be wrong that's the first reaction that's that's a normal organizational change reaction which we get um, and when we proved that actually the data was right there were big holes in the northeast and uh, in north wales where traditionally quite impoverished um, areas um, and traditionally they'd been quite a big giver so they said well the data's wrong so we lit it up and you know we proved that the data wasn't wrong and and it, it sent a message to themselves and and that was done by just joining up little bits of disparate data presenting it telling their story telling a digital story and and it speaks to digital based you know data based decision making so as a result of that data where where the focus was before in in another area and i can't go into too many details um they then said right we've got an issue there because we're not giving there's not enough interaction with these communities we'll do some outreach we'll commission some outreach um and that um we then saw their dashboards their ref counters suddenly as soon you know and you're actually almost seeing an immediate reaction um to that data so data you know there's that lovely now there's the capability the tools out there and i'm a bit passionate about this is the blending of your own data you, i think a lot of us know how what our own data is what it's telling us what the story is but it's the ability now to blend that with un, uh, other data sources i only talk about this because it's a, an area that I, I i kind of help people with is that you know things like there's a lot of free data available office national St statistics red cross um uh, the deprivation index, you, you're probably all the way around. People like um, 360 Giving, uh, we ourselves can can blend external data. So <laughs> I hate to say, we call it the Daily Mail test, um, uh, but you know, an organization maps their locational giving against the deprivation index for that area. And, and if they're giving in the three, four and five areas that are the, the most deprived in the UK, there is a defence there that they're doing stuff in the areas of most need in the UK. So let's talk about data. Um, you know, agility, we've seen agility over the last 15 months. That's no, only going to accelerate it in our view um, and uh, ownership and moving on. So moving on. So these will come out after. I'm just conscious that we're, we're getting close to time. Um, these are what I think are the seven priorities for um, digital transformation um, and it, really this is just a little bit talk about um, you know as digital leaders what do we need to be thinking about um, in terms of where we start and I, I have plagiarized this from the Association of Digital Business Leaders which is um, a thing that I've just done. First of all you need to adopt it's, it's corporate and retail driven but for, re for customers, read stakeholders, clients, donors, anything else but you need to adopt them better how are they in, look at yourself from their perspective 
is your website responsive? If they have to wait too long, they'll click and go elsewhere. Can people get money to you in the most efficient, modern ways possible? Have you optimized your digital channels? Have you got a click to collect button, click to donate button? Have you got a click to contact you button somewhere? You know, we've spoken about unlocking your data. There is a lot of messaging in your data. Data can help you um, decide on what is the most effective, what is the most priority, what is the most underutilized, what is what data is sitting there out on its own that no, in, in other words, if we've got it, why are we collecting that data and what are we doing with it? You know, innovation is only going to get quicker. Um, it's, it's a horrible triumph saying, but you know, it's that saying of let's not moan about the rug being pulled from under us. Let's learn how to dance on a moving rug. Um, and I think as leadership, we need to kind of engage with the generational shift that are coming through to help us innovate and iterate our products and services. You know, di digital disruption is, is huge um, at the moment, has been huge for some time. You know, it's a bit old hat now, but things like um, Airbnb, Uber, you know, who would ever thought in central London that black cabs would lose their monopoly um, as much as you love or hate Uber? Who would have thought that there was any other alternative other than a black cab to get around London? Um, well, Uber came in, no assets, no central office. Um, built up a huge business and they're called the unicorns because they get to 20 billion within a short period of time. So, you know, that's Unfortunately, the way we have to be thinking, you know, there are a lot of organizations that have um, directors of disruption. So it's their job not to, to help change, it's their change just to, to stir things up a little bit. Um, so um, just conscious of the time here, you know, maximize evolving technology. There's been a massive technological shift, you know, you know even things like telephony, um, if you think, you know, a year ago, Teams didn't have a viable alternative. Microsoft Teams didn't have a viable alternative for call handling. They were kind of behind the loop a little bit. You know, we ourselves in the past few days have just gone live on all of our telephony is going through Teams. Um, you know, we're all probably paying for that. You, you, you're already paying for the lines into the building. You just need to get them joined up with your team. So you've got, you know, one platform for your for your people to to, to control their work life with. Um, so you know that's the business. That's the evolving tech. You know, the other thing is the the seat at the table. You know, drive the digital mindset. Is there a trustee who is passionate about digital, who is passionate about cyber? Do they have a voice and do they have capability? So moving on to the next slide rushing a little bit but what makes the digital leader in our view um what makes a digital leader it needs to be digital fluent you don't have to know everything but you just need to know the basics you just need to know what you don't know in, in my view i'm you know i'm a bit of an old older guy now but uh, you know, the point is you need to surround yourself with people who do understand this um and who really enjoy it or passion out of us to a lot of us who weren't brought up through the digital age um i remember doing my accounting exams when the um the, the, the it paper was all about punch cards that shows you how old i am um but you know we don't need to know that but we need to know that it's different and that we need to know who to talk to if there's something wrong you need to be curious you know this colleague of mine who's known as the toddler because he constantly asks what why why are you doing that and if you accept the answer, well, we've always done it that way. Um, frankly, that's not the answer. I think experiment. The the other thing is we've got to get, in my view, we've got to get over this mindset of um, not being able to fail. Many text projects historically were tested to destruction um, because people were too afraid to fail. You know. There is a concept of fail fast, learn quick. So the whole concept of agile, agility, agile sprints versus a waterfall approach, you know, being able to actually look at something. And there are, if anyone's interesting, there are kind of data that says if you fail fast, learn quick, in the long run, you're going to spend less because we've all heard NHS, everything like that, that people who persevered with a project because they thought it was right. By the time it came to market, it was no longer right. It was no longer relevant and you spent all your money and a lot of risk. So that's the experimental bit. You know, I think it was the chief exec of Deloitte, who, I mean, even Apple um, say, you know, seven, they expect seven out of eight of their R&D projects to fail. But the one that does go through will be mind blowing. So that's where we are. Um, compliant, you know, we're all subject to um, 
information commissioner, cybersecurity, kind of audit, things like that. So, you know, you've got to have an eye on compliance. We can't, you have to take that seriously in my view. You know, you have to protect people's assets. There's a lot more visibility, there's a lot more channels for people to ask questions than complain. So, sorry, that was a ramp, very quick ramp through um, digital leadership, cybersecurity, um, and uh, I, I'm happy to now move on to the questions. If you've got any questions, um, I'm not saying I can answer them all today and we are running a little short on time, but if you've got them, the, the team here have been um, looking at questions. Um, I'm just kind of diving into a few of them now. I have the wrong screen on. OK, so got a question about the Information Commissioner's Office uh, about the data protection fees that they charge. What is the fee for or, and is it useful to get it, even though the charity could be exempted from paying? Um, that's a great question. Um, my advice to corporates, not charities, there is a specific exemption within, within the Act for exemptions. I'm not sure what you get from it. Um, we can all access the resources anyway for free. I think for charities, personal opinion um i'm not sure what you get for it there's been a massive trawl of um companies house and i think the charity commission register comparing the information commissioners data against their own data and seeing where there's gaps so you may have got a load of letters you know in the corporate world i say for 40 quid it's probably worth doing it even for 250 quid it's probably worth doing it um i'm not convinced there's a lot of benefit from that from doing it unless you just want to it's, it's the same challenge about a data protection officer the the circumstances to have a data protection officer are are very limited to call them a data protector officer obviously you need to fulfill that obligation but if you want to make a pr issue out of it or you want to say hold your hand up and say look we're doing things as compliant as safely as hygienic as as we want as we can then you can make an effect of it so, uh, so moving on to the other question um what advice do you have to manage password changes it's so difficult to remember passwords well so a number of things to that single sign-on is awesome so if you're within the organization most modern cloud software internal software have what's called single sign-on so the only software you ever have to remember is the one that gets you into your corporate thing the beauty of that is as soon as people leave the organization their account is shut down therefore their single sign-on shut down so if they are using cloud you know dropbox or something like that and it's got single sign-on as soon as they leave an organization and you've um, suspended their account, they no longer have single sign-on. So that's one thing in terms of single sign-on. The other thing is what I use, um, I think it's fair to say Edge and Safari. So Edge is the latest Microsoft browser, Safari is the Apple browser. All of them have, have improved their capability in terms of being able to remember passwords for you and also to tell you if your password has been seen in a breach. I personally, I use those, but I also use um, a password keeper. There's things like LastPass, OnePass, eWallet, that sort of stuff. So that's all I can have say on that. Um, should you use a suggested password that's generated? Yeah, why not? I'll get them or do it again, generate another one. You know, it's going to be stronger. You don't have to remember it. You know, one word on passwords is the there's an old adage, the the three things adage. So you sit in your you sit in your seat and you look at three things in front of you that no one else will know. So I'm sitting here. Sorry, there's a bottle of champagne above my desk. So um it could be champagne, folder, um, and photo. That could be your password. Um, so it's making it difficult. So don't use your mother's maiden name. Don't use your cat, your first cat, because as we've seen on Facebook, that can be fished. Um, so how do we protect, anonymous question, how do we protect files held in the cloud? Conscious of time, but I'll, I will keep going for now. Um, how do we protect files in the cloud? Well, I think, frankly, if stuff's in the Microsoft Azure cloud, so if you're using Microsoft Azure, it's got the same protection as Office 365. You can put multi-factor authentication and starter lever processes. Um, they're constantly protecting your perimeters. There are security packages that scan the cloud. They're not cheap for, for not-for-properties. Um, that sort of stuff. Could I please report the organization for non-profit cybersecurity, NCSC? Yes, it was. It's the National Center for Cybersecurity, NC. 
yeah, I know it is ncsc.org, uh, but it's the National Centre for Cybersecurity. Um, government's put a massive amount of money into protection now. They kind of run GCHQ, but they're good. Um, elements involved in getting cyber essential certification, get in touch with me. I'll run through that. Um, and, and it's not a sales pitch. What I've done with a lot of organisations is I've done a high level rather than the intrusive review and, and getting probes. I think the first thing is, is to do um, a gap analysis, how close or how far away from it. Um, so my suggestion is to do that first to see whether you would actually get it. Um, and that can be quite efficient because if you're miles away and it needs every single laptop being replaced then that's something that's more important perhaps to focus on than just getting cyber essentials so get in touch we can help with that um insurers willing to provide cyber insurance to charities um unfortunately uh, and this is anecdotally um and it's been seen by observation um the insurance companies all been hit by ransomware so um insurance the, there's two schools of thought if you've got it then it's great. It's becoming expensive, especially over the last 12 months. Um, there is an argument they've all been hacked, so it's, provi it's provided a nice shopping list to any potential hackers. So the first place people go is to those that carry insurance. So, yeah, <laughs> that's a decision that you're going to have to make yourselves. Um, how, how, I'm just running through the questions. How would you determine a system as aging infrastructure? We well, don't have to determine. Microsoft will tell you. So things like Server 2012, um, Windows XP, you know, keep in touch with the Microsoft site. Um, they are the guys that tell you when things are going out sport. So I think it's the 11th of October. Anything that's got Silverlight in it, and Silverlight was the next big thing. I'm so old, I remember Silverlight coming in. It was the next big thing. It was going to revolutionise our life. Um, but it's going out of support as of the 11th of October. It will no longer work. Um, so if you've got Silverlight in it, stuff just won't work. Um, so um, <laughs> how can trustees encourage challenge prompt IT leaders without annoying them? Brackets, I'm an IT leader. Awesome question, Paul. Uh, um, I think as with all things, it's about having a conversation. It's about having a seat. It's about listening to people. You know, we am, we engage and employ both our external, you know, external supporters, our internal tech people, because they're experts. They know things that we don't know. So if we're not going to listen to them, if we're going to push our own agenda, um, you're going to be hostage to your own fortune, frankly. I think it's giving them a seat at the table, having a conversation, knowing what questions to ask, listening to them. Um, I t there was one organisation, it was a lovely convent in, in South West London. They were really good at what they did. And bizarrely, for a change, I was so impressed by their external tech support team. And I just frankly act as I acted as marriage broker. So list did the translation because let's be face, you know, I, I'm not a tech guy, but tech guys don't always speak. They speak in ones and zeros. Sorry, joke. Um, but so I think sometimes to act as a marriage broker or a, a relationship broker um, and a translator, you know, that was a very short conversation. It was half a day with those two organizations sitting in a room, frankly saying, well, you're saying this. I agree with this. Convent, you need to do this. Um, or this is the impact if you don't do it. It's up to you if you accept, transfer, mitigate, deny the risk. That's up to you. OK. Um, did I say it was a charity that helped with cyber attack? They're not a charity. They're they're hacked. To, they're an actor. I think it's anonymous, if I remember rightly. Anonymous, who did a lot of uh, extinction within rebellion and things like that, were attacking large corporations. They've now um, with the resurgence of terrorism and the war on terror, they seem to have focused that um, question. Final question, um, are VPNs no longer safe? Yes, they are. Um, the latest version, as long as they're patched, updated, controlled, um, they deal with behavior. They're multi, if you haven't got multi, I, I really encourage you to put multi-factor authentication on them. Um, you know, if if your supplier hasn't got MFA, on your VPN, so you know the ability. So if I log into our Buscot VPN, I have to have my mobile phone because it needs my face. So I start off on the computer, something pings up on my phone, I look at my phone, and I'm in.
but I can't get in unless I do that. And there are other alternatives like texts, messages, landline phone calls with codes and stuff like that. So they are safe, but as with the patching um, configuration, they need to be up to date, patched, controlled, regularly reviewed. You can't just leave them. They've got to be in focus. And if you outsource your support, if your supplier isn't talking to you about that, then I'd be a little bit disappointed. So drawing to a close, we're about 20, a little bit over. Um, don't seem to have any more questions. Um, so all the business thank you for your time. We'll follow up with the slides. Uh, it's been lovely to you. I hope we get the chance to meet you uh, in the future. Please do get in touch if you need to get in touch. Thank you and good morning.